training runs and he would tell the mechanics, uh, the, the, the support staff there at the Air Force Base, not to put any more gas in his plane. And it, wherever the mark, the fuel mark was, he said, don't fuel it all the way up. Just leave it where it is. And he would get in the plane, go out, do runs, and test himself, meaning he would go out far enough, do runs, do his, you know, different figures, whatever he's doing. And invariably, Thorpe could time it. This is how brilliant this brother was. He could time it so that as he was coming in back on the strip for a landing, the plane ran out of gas. Wait, wait. So um, <laughs> let's just be clear. So I was, I was talking about American experience on PBS. Fly yes. with, and I, you know, I'm, I'm committing myself to watching more documentaries and then asking you how uh, how valid they are. <laughs> so that's kind of my process. Uh, but you, you think about people now talking about, you know, the safety of planes and DEI and not wanting black people in. They never wanted us in. And we were starting. I had a gentleman on my show this week. Um, who wants to start an airline. And I didn't know that there was already, you know, I know Bessie Coleman, you know, you know, we know historically. Well, no, no, there, there, there were several, there were several airlines. There, were, there was a black airline out of Atlanta about maybe five, four or five years ago. I was coming through the Atlanta airport and invariably, like I always do, I did it uh, when I was headed to Columbia, South Carolina on Tuesday. And I did it again when I came here to Chicago yesterday. I stop in the airport bookstores because typically, and this is just a tip for folks who are traveling through airports, what they've started doing now, I think it's Arcadia Press, is that if you're in a city, if there are books about that city that the History Press or Arcadia Press has done, these are little picture books that you see with the covers that are almost like in sepia tone, they will have them in the bookstores. Um, there in, in, in the New York area, you know, of course, Hudson Books, which is ubiquitous now. They seem to be everywhere. W.H. Austin, some others. They will have a, a book tower, like the old comic book tower, and they'll have these little books. And so I've picked up a number of books on black history in various cities in airports because they, they concentrate them. And you may have one or two little books on black Charlotte or black Chicago or black Columbia, South Carolina, or black whatever, in on those towers. And I was coming through the Atlanta airport a few years ago and went in their bookstore and picked up a book about a brother who started a black airline company in Atlanta. Duh. And Delta is there. So they said, we would need a black airline company. And just to put a bow on what I was mentioning with Thorpe, Thorpe, who also was at Howard when NASA uh, gave them samples from the moon rocks, saw that there was, for the first time in 50 years, the United States landed, a un, uh, landed something on the moon uh, the other day. Uh, un un unpersoned, of course, but they still landed it. But they gave them moon rocks to study. This is the great Arthur Thorpe, Professor Arthur Thorpe, who is now an ancestor. But I remember standing in the parking lot at Howard outside the physics and astronomy building many days listening to Thorpe tell stories. And the reason I brought him up is because Arthur Thorpe himself, this legendary pilot, scientist, Arthur Thorpe was part of a consortium that started a black airline. In other words, so, so anybody talking about starting a black airline now, first of all, we can throw away the garbage, throw away that social structure, kind of blackface minstrelsy like soul playing. This is not the time for a punchline in that regard. We're talking about airlines. And yes, black people started airlines in this country. And there's a history of that. And so I'm sure they covered that in Fly With Me, right? Well, no, because it was oh. lens. Okay. We okay. already it was, it was <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, but this just goes to show you, right? In fact, it's so funny. Last night here at Dusabo, Bob Starks, Dr. Bob Starks, who I mentioned uh, last week when we were talking about the space race, came. His wife, of course, her cousin, was married to Dr. Lawrence, who was the second black person recruited into the astronaut program after um, our brother, the, the, the sculptor now, Ed Dwight. And he came and he said, you know, my wife wasn't able to make it tonight, but she wanted to tell you and Karen, thank you all for raising Dr. Lawrence, because people don't remember that. Of course, uh, Lawrence was Francis Cress Welsing's brother-in-law, her sister, Lauren Cress Love's husband, 
of course, the, the, the Crest sisters, Lauren Crest and Francis Crest, now we know Francis Crest Wilson, are from Chicago. So those people came last night and they told me to tell you thank you for raising that name because in the space race, they didn't talk about Dr. Lawrence, a PhD in chemistry from Ohio State University, uh, Air Force uh, pilot who was the second black person recruited, but who did not become a full astronaut because he died in a training mission crash. And so, I mean, you know, all these connections are here in the governance formation. So, you know, as Nubia expands and this narrative expands and as this incredible work, this journey that we're on expands, and there were so many Nubians here last night, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. You know, that's another documentary to make because Fly With Me is nice, but you want to talk about who we are to you, you know, where we sit on a plane that you control, but we started companies too. And that's just a prelude to the companies we will start in the future. Because never forget, we are black in the world, not just black in the United States, as Du Bois tried to reiterate over and over again. And there are plenty of airline companies run by black people, not in the United States. So real, be very careful about the American Negro. Once we re remember that these little, this little funky border or these flags, they shouldn't mean more to us than who we are to each other. And there's a history of us connecting with each other. So yeah. Oh, 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 oh what's the brother? I just want to thank you for yeah, even course, bringing up today. I mean, last week the space program. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, you know how wild it is. That well, that's on you. You watched that documentary first. I know. Uh, what what happened? Oh no, Doctor Carr's um, internet. Most of I didn't do anything. So hopefully he will pop back in. In the meantime, I will do this. I pop, Looks like I, there it. we go. Okay. There we, there we are. Tell them the, de the devil is a liar. Yes, absolutely. But yes, I did bring it up, but I had no, I, when you connected the dots and said Africa space program, and I was like, of course, of course. even bring the airline to be in Africa, to fly in Africa, to other places in Africa, because it's the largest landmass continent in the world. You have to, of course, get on a plane to go to a plane. You know, it's like, oh, everybody on here is African. <laughs> the pilots are they're all the airlines and there are multiple airlines in Africa. No question. Right. South African Air and Nigeria Air, two of the biggest. Egypt Air that we fly, Ethiopian Airlines. And remember the Ethiopian uh, flight program beginning with the Ethiopian military was set up by a black American after World War I who went over there, Robinson and the Brown Condor, they went over there and set up the program. I'm saying, so, you know, they can't capture who we are to each other because it's not their agenda. Their agenda is to wed us to their vision. And that's fine for you, but that's not who we are. Our problem is when we do the same thing. That's our problem. I'm so sorry. no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So as Dr. Du Bois, and I, as uh, we've been sitting with his text for several weeks in- Yes, we have. You know, yeah. But I'm also like, how did he, you know, the way in which he saw the world, us, the future, was able to look into the future was, you know, just beyond um, belief for, you know, because we don't have people with that kind of vision today. And you think about him writing something in 1940 and then being able to project and then understanding, oh, this war is speeding it up and then asking the question, like who really, who will we be then? Because now we have a larger issue. It's easy to be contained in somebody else's imagination because you don't have to do anything. But now right. we're over here. What is our responsibility to ourselves first and then collectively as we navigate what the future should look like because we are responsible for shaping it or being victimized by it. Mm -hmm. Our responsibility is, is to humanity, isn't it? I mean, our, our responsibility doesn't end with black people, realizing that black people as a group, and we talked about, we talk about this a lot in, in the critical race theory class I'm teaching at the law school at Howard, you know, our grouping as black people was imposed on us by a social structure. Now, what we do with that is not entirely up to us, but it is largely up to us. Meaning you, we were grouped together by phenotype, by skin color, by continent of origin. And we were pulled into a criminal enterprise as captives and forced into death camps, various configurations of death camps for centuries. And then, and then trapped in those things over many generations. Fighting out of that, resisting that, uh, which is why the second framing question in our, in our six framing questions in our Africana Studies uh, framework is how did Africans preserve and affirm their various ways of life and use our identities and our cultures as means to resist oppression 
as we resisted, we found commonalities between ourselves that then began to form the basis for a sense of collective weeness, a, a weeness, a, a, an identity, a kind of shared, not only set of experiences, but shared cultural meaning making, shared ways of knowing that we became aware of under the duress of oppression that began to build the possibility of a we. Not everybody the same, but everybody being able to be grouped in kind of broader sense. And where we were different, we often traded. Igbo, village people. Yoruba, large systems. Find yourself in Haiti, put your skills together, put your various ways of knowing together, and you invent Vodun. You invent, and you use that to resist. So our responsibility <clears throat> was first to survive, first and then to thrive. And in thriving then, the larger responsibility is to speak, as uh, Malana Karenga often says, speak our special truth to the world and then help humanity benefit from our special truths. And, and finally, that, that, that's, that has a particular resonance because when we, as we will on Monday night, encourage everybody of the thousands of people we have now, not just in narrative, but in Nubia, uh, and we have thousands on every Monday night, if you've missed, if you haven't been following along and we reach the end of these 10 speeches that Dr. Du Bois gives, which means we started this journey two months ago, two and a half months ago. But this final speech, Whither Now and Why, in 1960, that Dr. Du Bois, he and his partner, his comrade, his wife, his companion, um, Shirley Graham Du Bois, were both attending a conference at Johnson C. Smith University, in fact, uh, of social scientists and social science teachers. In fact, um, it was the 25th conference of the Association of Black Social Science Teachers. And then they published the speech that we just heard a bit of, that you just played a bit of, in the quarterly review of higher education among Negroes, the July 1960 uh, edition. This was the same spring and early summer when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was founded. SNCC was founded just down the road at Shaw University. If I was at, at the apartment, I would pull the volumes. I could show you the volumes of the quarterly uh, that has the speech in it. But a lot of people connect. When I don't say a lot of people, when I say that, it's a little abstract. Um, some people, I've, I've read that a couple of people have done this, and I think it's actually a, a good comparison. They compare the 1960 speech that Du Bois gives, which we'll talk about more in a moment, with a speech he gave in 1897 called The Conservation of Races. So six decades, six plus decades, 63 years after he gives the speech, as a 29-year-old in Washington, D.C., at a meeting of the American Negro Academy, the great Alexander Cremel and Kelly Miller and... Uh, Anna Julia Cooper and Arturo Schomburg and Alain Locke and Carter Woodson and this, 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 this grouping of black thinkers. 63 years later from the speech he gave in 1897 when he said, you know, races are problematic. The concept of race is problematic. However, groupings of people who have been labeled races often have certain cultural truths, cultural experiences that they should conserve in order to contribute to our larger humanity. 63 years later, you see Du Bois being remarkably consistent, even as he has changed so much over the decades. As he says, even in this speech in 1960, he said, you know, they took my passport for nine years. They took Paul and Essie Robeson's passports for nine years. When they restored them, my wife and I went around the world. We went to Russia, we went to China, Yugoslavia. We went a lot of different places around. He says, I've traveled the world many times, but that trip I took after I got my passport back in 1958, changed everything for me. And there's a famous picture of him standing laughing with Mao Zedong in China. He said, I, I was treated like, you know, my wife and I, we were treated like royalty in these places. I saw a different approach to health care. I saw a different approach to public transportation. I saw a different approach to feeding people. I saw different concepts. He said, socialism is the future. He talks about that in this essay, but I'm bringing that up to say that even as Du Bois changed over the decades, one of the things he remained remarkably consistent about was this idea that cultures should come together and broaden our awareness as human beings of each other. He called it broad sympathy elsewhere. We should, human beings should have a broad sympathy for other people. And he says there's something very valuable about having different 
cultural experiences that you can contribute to our larger humanity. So in 1960, Du Bois not only says we should do it, he says we must do it because that is our obligation to humanity. But you can't get there by disappearing. You can't get there by submerging your special experiences and your cultural, uh, your ways of knowing and your cultural meaning making. You can't do that. You can't do that until you're aware of it and you can't be aware of it without institutions and you can't have institutions without sacrifice and you can't sacrifice without finding in yourself the will to make that kind of sacrifice. It's very interesting. He says, you know, I've talked about it. He talked about a talented 10th early on in the, early, the first decade of the 20th century. He comes back around in the 1930s. He gives a speech to Sigma Pi Phi, an organization he was brought into that some people called the Boule in New York. He says, I was wrong. It ain't even 10% of us can do anything. He says, you know, maybe there's a guiding hundredth, but a talented 10th, 10% will be we'll doing well. We don't even have that. By the time he gets to wither now and why, he says, are we willing to sacrifice? He says, I'm not sure. Remember the speech he gave last week that we talked about at length at Knoxville, at, a link, at Knoxville College. He says, I'm not sure that the Negro will sacrifice. And by within a while, he's like, we should give up a quarter of our income, 25% of our income for education because you can't have institutions unless you sacrifice and you won't sacrifice until you see the value in it and you won't see the value in it until you reclaim what we are always calling the momentum of memory. So, so Prof, when you ask, you know, what are our objectives? What are our obligations? Our obligations are to, and in fact, I'll just quote Du Bois in this, and we're going to talk about this at length, as I said, on Monday night. When I'm, uh, when will I be here? No, I'm going to be in Atlanta by then, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. He says, well, on the 25%, let me just say, he says on page 203 of uh, the Education of Black People, Negroes must give not a tenth but a quarter of their income to support education and social organization and teachers must sacrifice to the last penny. This impoverishment of the truth seekers can only be avoided by eventually making the state bear the burden of education. And this is socialism. We must then vote for socialism. We began this in the New Deal and then were stopped. Both, but in Europe and Asia and also in Africa, socialism and communism are spreading. Socialism will grow in the United States if we restore the democracy of which we have boasted so long and done so little. Here is where the Negroes may and must lead. Now, of course, this is 1960. Bernie Sanders, who comes to public attention first for black people when he supports the Jesse Lewis Jackson campaign, is a new exhibit at the Chicago uh, historical Center on uh, an oral history of Jesse Jackson. I'm hoping to skirt by there sometime this afternoon before I get on the plane to head to Atlanta. But that's not where I wanted to read. I wanted to uh, to, so, to cite what Du Bois says. Here it is. He says this. He says, y'all might think that in me calling for us to conserve what is valuable about ourselves as African people, that I'm calling for segregation. In fact, he says on page 195 at the end, he says, to some folk, this type of argument would lead to the conclusion that we ought to refuse to enter white schools or to clamor for unsegregated schools. In other words, that we ought to give up the fight against color discrimination. Du Bois says, I want, however, to emphasize that this is not only unnecessary, but impossible. We must accept equality or die. What we must also do is to lay down a line of thought and action which will accomplish two things. The utter disappearance of color discrimination in American life, that's the legal side that he says is gonna change. Even if he came, even as if he came back today, he would like, the laws changed and they did exactly what I thought they might do. They changed the laws, but they didn't change how they treat you. So that's the first thing, the utter disappearance of color discrimination in American life. And here's the valuable thing that, take, that we have to now emphasize, the preservation of African history and culture as a valuable contribution to modern civilization as it was to medieval and ancient civilization. To do this is not easy. It calls for intelligence, cooperation, and careful planning. It would meet head on the baffling difficulties that face us today. Now, Du Bois is almost like a seer. We're going to talk about all this on Monday night, but it's good to do a preview today for a few reasons I'll get into now. Because 
It's all there for us to renew ourselves, to reclaim, to become aware of, to regain what we always call here the momentum of memory so that nobody is starting from scratch because anybody think they're, they think they're the first to do something in terms of improving African life, you're not. You may be the first to avail yourself of a certain technology that is available now that wasn't available before, a certain modality that was available now that isn't that wasn't available before, but you're not the first to think about that. And it's the momentum of memory that fortifies us and reminds us that not only can we do it, we must do it. So, in fact, I'm, I, you know what, Prof, I am compelled to do this before I get into where, where, where we were last night where I'm going to be tomorrow and where I was on Tuesday. So shout out to Columbia, South Carolina, to the people here in the great black metropolis, as St. Clair Drake and Horace Caton would call it, of Chicago. And of course, to uh, a place they call the Mecca, where I'll be tomorrow through the next couple of days, and that's Atlanta. It's very poignant that that trifecta is there and all the Nubians who have been coming out. Du Bois says this. He says, what I've been fighting for, this is on page 195, what I have been fighting for and am still fighting for is the possibility of black folk and their cultural patterns. That's what's written in the book. But if you listen to the audio that you just played all the way through, he says black folk and black cultural patterns. He's using the B word black in 1960. What I have been fighting for and am still fighting for is the possibility of black folk and black cultural patterns existing in America without discrimination, there's the whole thing the social structure wants us to focus on, fighting against discrimination, being able to sit where you want on the bus or the plane or the train, okay, getting a hamburger, whatever the hell you want to be, you know, fighting against police brutality, all those things, very important, but that's a threshold goal. And he says, and on terms of equality, he says, if we take this attitude, we have got to do so consciously and deliberately. This brings up a number of difficult, difficult problems which we will have to solve and make definite preparation for such solution. Now listen to this. This is the paragraph I want to emphasize for now. He says, take for instance, this is when the laws change. Take when the laws change and there are no overt, de jure, Jane and Jim Crow laws. No legal apartheid in the United States of America. It moves to another battleground, the issues of race and culture. He says, when that happens, take, for instance, the current problem of the education of our children. By the law of the land today, they should be admitted to the public schools. If and when they are admitted to these schools, certain things will inevitably follow. This is 1960. Du Bois says Negro teachers will become rarer and in many cases will disappear. Negro children will be instructed in the public schools and taught under unpleasant, if not discouraging circumstances. Even more largely than today, they will fall out of school, cease to enter high school, and fewer and fewer will go to college. Theoretically, Negro universities will disappear. Negro history will be taught less or not at all, as and as in so many cases in the past, Negroes will remember their white or Indian ancestors and quite forget their Negro forebearers. He, he, he's, he's saying when they integrate, when they desegregate, you're going to lose your soul in a flood of whiteness. And here's the trick that he didn't catch. The laws changed and segregation remained. The school district of Chicago highly segregated, the school district of New York, the school district of Atlanta, the school district of Los Angeles, the school district of Boulder, Colorado, the school districts in the United States of America, the public school districts, highly segregated, more segregated now than at the end of US apartheid, legal apartheid. Du Bois didn't catch that, but what he did catch is, they are gonna get rid of your teachers. And your children gonna be in schools where the teachers don't like them, they don't like teachers, they are gonna stop going to school, they gonna, they're not gonna make it to high school, they won't go to college. Now people say, well, college numbers are up. Yeah, really? Okay, let's go K-12 and understand what has happened to our children since Du Bois gave this speech and then him and Shirley got on a plane and left for Africa and said, chin up and fight on, but recognize that American Negroes can't win. Meaning what? Chin up and fight on, but recognize that as long as you isolate yourself from the rest of the people, this is a problem. In fact, he goes on to say that. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Du Bois says, if you don't, here we go. He says this, 
Today, when the African people are arising to settle their own problems, we are in a peculiar position, me, me meaning American Negroes, of being in a group of persons of Negro descent who not only cannot help the Africans, but in most cases do not want to. Any statement of our desire to develop American Negro culture, to keep up our ties with colored people, to remember our past is being regarded as racism. This is the little face racism. I, for instance, who have devoted my life to efforts to break down racial barriers and being accused of desiring to emphasize differences of race. Du Bois kind of cracked the joke here. He says, that has a certain ring of truth about it. As I said before, and I repeat, I'm not fighting to settle the question of racial equality in America by the process of getting rid of the Negro race, getting rid of black folk, not producing black children, forgetting the slave trade and slavery and the struggle for emancipation of forgetting abolition. And especially this is this is critical because everything he just named before that, that's in these American history books that include black people. It's even in the black American history books. Let's go through that line again. Forgetting the slave trade and slavery. And the struggle for emancipation or forgetting abolition, that stuff is in there. And he says, and especially this is what's not in there of ignoring the whole cultural history of Africans in the world. Just about every African-American history textbook that our young people use is virtually worthless on the question of the momentum of memory. They narrate African experiences as a sequence of experiences that don't have the momentum of memory so that even when Africa is mentioned, even when it's mentioned generously, what is missing is the difficult work of tracing the full arc of Africana genealogies, who we are to each other, which you would think might be impossible for people who are afraid of their masters or who actually do believe somehow that the sum purpose of African existence in the United States of America is to build the United States of America. It's an absurd position. We talked about that last night. But Du Bois here is raising the question that we have not yet confronted. What does it mean to be of African descent in the world? What does it mean to be part of a community that was created through force, but that has something to say to the world through choice and self-determination? That is an open question, and many have tried to answer it over the years. So let me just spend a second here, again, reminding us of, 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 of where we are right now, where we're, we're having this conversation. And there are a lot of people in this virtual room right now who were here last night uh, came at the invitation of the DuSabo Museum, formerly started as the Ebony Museum in 1961 in the home of Margaret, Dr. Mar Margaret Burroughs and her husband, Charles Burroughs, Charlie Burroughs, the Ebony Museum, then named after DuSabo, the so-called, the founder of Chicago, this African. Um, Perry Ermer, the director of the DuSabo Museum, our sister and fellow Nubian, Dr. Kim Delaney, uh, who directs education programs here, to, as they call it, the DU, the DU, the DU Sabo. Everybody got nicknames, right? Um, I was invited here to have a conversation last night, and we did, on jailbreaking the Black University. And I'm going to talk more about that in sequence, but I do want to pause here to mention that because when uh, in this auditorium, it's a big space, as you can see. You can't see the stage. I'm, I'm, I'm between the stage, the catwalk. The first one, two, three, four, five rows. I'm in the fifth row, and then there's a aisle, and then back behind me, you can see some of the the theater here in in, in the dark, in the in the kind of nominal dark, the glooming. So many people came out. All all the family from the Comedic Institute, Charles and Carolyn Grantham, my mother, my mother and father, um, my mother Ife Carruthers. So good to see Mama Ife here last night. Um, by the SWAT. I mean, so many people from the Comedic Institute, which is the reason I'm sitting here again with the African Center for Study and Worship in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, that's the study groups. And as I told them last night, when you see Nubia, you see narrative, you're seeing an extension of all that work that we were able to be in together. Chicago is is a, is an anchor. This, this place, particularly the Midwest, Detroit, Chicago, this is where many of the institutions that Black people created came into existence. Ebony Magazine, of course, Johnson Publications is a great exhibit out in the foyer on John H. Johnson. Uh, Third World Press, Baba Haki Mahabudi. In fact, the last time I was in this auditorium, 
it was in August 2019 for a memorial to the great Anderson Thompson and Baba Haki was here and so many others, Bob Starks and so many people who were here tonight, last night were, were here that time. Uh, this is an institutional space. Um, so many Nubians, I don't mean two or three or 10 or 15 or 20, it's my half the audience and there was a bunch of people here tonight, last night and then they streamed it on their Facebook live channel. I think Kim said they're gonna put it on their YouTube channel as well. And at one point there were about 500 people who were watching on YouTube, uh, on, uh, on uh, Facebook live. And you know, I don't have Facebook accounts so I had to rely on them. I said, oh wow, look, these people are here. So there's a lot of people who are here now who were watching there because we did send a link out. And then at the end, we were having conversation. We had about 45 minutes of discussion after Kim and I were in conversation about this question of jailbreaking the black university. And as I said, Karen, everybody told me, tell you hello when you come in. Oh, this is a beautiful thing. And um, near the end, a sister was like, you know, Dr. Carr, let's talk about Jeremiah Wright. And I said, oh, Jeremiah Wright is a master teacher. And then somebody said, he's here. I said, he's not here. That's what Kim said, he's not here. He was sitting right back there in the cut with his black his scully on <laughs> in his chair. So Baba J, who's here today, I'm sure, we had an opportunity. And the minute everybody realized he had snuck in here, really, with his black leather jacket on, looking just as Chicago South Side as you can get, I, we all stood up and gave him a standing ovation. And, you know, so Jeremiah Wright was here. Uh, to, and it gave me an opportunity to talk about what he has meant, not only, to, and what he means, not only to us, but to the world. And to say that in Chicago, in Chicago, a stone's throw from Trinity, United Church of Christ. So everybody was here. But the lesson really we began to emerge last night is that we are our authority. And that we have to control, create and control independent black spaces. In fact, let me, um, on the, on the way here, you know, as I was moving some things around, I came across a very interesting book by a good brother, Worth Camille Hayes, who is at Tuskegee. It's called Schools of Our Own, Chicago's Golden Age of Black Private Education. This has been on my shelf uh, since it came out in 2020. Northwestern University Press, which is in on the north side of Chicago. Northwestern is closer to Wrigley Field, north side, you know, white side. And we talked about in, 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 in class back during the heart of the pandemic, Fred Hampton, of course, Mark Clark assassinated here in 1969 and how they were building that rainbow coalition. We know the, the phrase rainbow coalition from Jesse Lewis Jackson, who was just here, according to the disciple folk, Kim was saying uh, he was here uh, last week, Reverend Jackson. And, and, and offered some words at an event here that, um, but the Rainbow Coalition, the concept comes out of the Black Panthers, uh, the hillbillies, the white, the white uh, young people, North Side Chicago, the Brown Berets, I'm sorry, the Young Lords, not the Brown Berets, the Young Lords, which uh, was founded in Chicago, uh, the Spanish speaking community, this kind of multi-hued, multicultural, uh, thrust, revolutionary thrust of people. But I bring up this book because what Professor Hayes does, and as I said, he's a professor at Tuskegee uh, now down in Alabama. I'm loving this, Prof, as I get a chance to be around. And this is just a prelude to what we're going to do in the summer. I'm very much looking forward to all of the things, not just Saturdays, not just Mondays, but expanding this face-to-face, voice-to-voice, breast-to-breast, mouth-to-ear, breath-to-breath conversation that we have in Narrative and Nubia, and we just continue to grow in that space. So everybody stay tuned. Again, these are just previews being out in these various places. Um, I am grateful, however, that we've added the DuSable Museum to the museums we've been able to be in, because remember, we were all out together in class at Wilberforce at the National African American History and Culture Center in Wilberforce, Ohio. So now we've got the DuSable in. I'm looking forward to the Charles Wright, right, the Charles Wright in Detroit and some other places. But the, the book that Camille Hayes has, has written, Worth Camille Hayes has written, he talks about these black independent schools that came into existence here in Chicago. He talks about the Howleton Day School. He talks about the Holy Name of Mary. Uh, the Howleton Day School was 1946 to 1986. The Holy Name of Mary, and you can imagine Catholic, Black Catholic Church, 1940 to, 19, to 2002. The chapter that really 
drew my interest initially when the book came out that I was able to have a little bit of a conversation with folks here in Chicago last night because many of them who are some of the people who are nearest and dearest to my heart, to my soul, to my mind, to my spirit, were founders of and remain connected with the African-centered education movement, including Mama Ife, Ife Carruthers, who's a stalwart there, including Larry Crow, of course, who I'll see a couple of days at the History Makers because he's down there. He's, you know, he's essential to the History Makers. And shout out to Juliana Richardson and all her staff at the History Makers. We'll be talking about that in a minute, too. But chapter four is, quote, we have done black things today and we're going to do black things again tomorrow, end quote. New Concept Development Center, 1972 to 1998. That, of course, New Concept Development Center, the Institute for Positive Education, those formations, as James Smethers calls them in his book on the Black Arts Movement, Institutions for the People, these are the institutions that were devoted to educating our children. And they struggled because the idea was we're not going to take money from the state. We're not going to take public dollars. We're not going to become part of the, the formal public school education system. Even as many of our Teachers, the people who work at the institutions, at the schools, are school teachers who also work in the public schools. Because as Jacob Carruthers famously said many years ago, I remember that we had a meeting of the National Board of Education for People of African Ancestry in Philadelphia, the Community College of Philadelphia. We had a meeting. Uh, this would have been in the maybe mid-90s. And Dr. Carruthers opened the, con uh, the, the conference with a talk about you know, what he ended up calling black talk and the white question. And he said, you know, we can never forget that the vast majority of our children are in the public schools and we have to intervene in the public schools. And they intervened in places like Chicago and the public schools, but they also built independent schools that weren't, did not rely on the state. And so there came a time, however, when they weren't able to sustain those schools. They weren't able to sustain those schools. And, 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 and that's because, you know, often the challenges include we need material resources. And then the class tensions begin to emerge because some of the children who were in these schools were in households where their parents had enough money to afford $1,500 uh, $1, a year or $2,000 a year. We're talking about now the 1970s, 80s even $3,000 a year for tuition. And then other households, they didn't have that kind of money, but the commitment was to educate these children so that you know people ended up not being able to pay in the same way. And eventually the choice was made. And I remember this quite distinctly, not only in Chicago, but around the United States of America, because at its peak, there was a formation of the African Center Schools together, and it was called the Council of Independent Black Institutions, CB. A, a pillar of CB, who we were in Indianapolis a couple of weeks ago for her ritual, Mashariki Jawanza. And of course, that's where, again, somebody mentioned uh, in, in class or in office hours, uh, yeah, in, in class last week, we started talking about Kazi being the blackest of all a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that, that phrase coming out of uh, CAPT, Congress of African Peoples, another stalwart organization with, with deep roots here in Chicago as well, Mary, Mary Baraka. All of that comes out of that African-centered movement, and at the center of that African-centered movement was education. And I remember quite distinctly in the early to mid-90s, the debate over whether or not these independent black schools should avail themselves of public tax dollars through becoming charter schools. And it was a debate inside of the African-centered education movement that caused tensions, that caused rifts, that have since healed, but caused real debate over whether to do it. There, was, uh, there were groups that said, no, we are not going to take public dollars. We don't, want that. we don't want them in here dealing with us like this. Our students overperform, outperform anybody in the public schools. It's not a question of that. When these young, the, I've had over the years so many students who came out of the independent schools, Quilombo in Atlanta, um, uh, Inseroma Institute, Du Bois Academy, and Aisha Shule in Detroit. I started naming them, I, I'll leave people out, who showed up at Howard 20 years ago and were at the top of their classes, African-centered through and through. That's all they knew. And, but the debate was we can't keep the doors open with the limited resources we have. And so what ends up happening is some of those schools became charter schools because the charter school movement in this country, as we know, stoked and fomented by naked white nationalists 
the DeVos family and others in Michigan, uh, the, the insurrection against Brown versus Board of Education that took place that led to the uh, segregated academies of the South, many of which still exist, uh, which are pretty white, except when you start talking about basketball teams and football teams and other formations. Now they, they use the charter schools to create their white nationalist bastions. Well, the African Senate schools, many of them, some of them anyway, decided to avail themselves of those public dollars and became charter schools, but it caused real tension in the African Senate education movement. This is what happens when, as Du Bois goes back to 1960, said we should be given a quarter of our resources to education. Yeah, Du Bois said, I don't know if we gonna do it. And no, we didn't do it. We did the best we could in the African Senate movement these are true, true titans of education, true titans of education. Uh, people like Barbara Sizemore, people um, like Haki Mabuti and Safisha Mabuti, people like Ife Carruthers and Larry Crow, people like all the people associated with Ipe and, and with New Concept Development Center, people who all over this country, Imani Humphrey in Detroit, for example, with the Du Bois Academy and Aisha Shule, these are masters. And, you know, but I'm saying all that to say that that commitment, that sacrifice wasn't enough to sustain these schools. And when you combine that with the repression they faced from state and local government and federal government, commingled with the, with the naked oppression and the assault by the federal government against black nationalism and black and pan-Africanism, when you combine that with the ideological tensions in these liminal spaces, and, and a liminal space is a space between spaces, this brings up the, the, the question I'm always asking myself, you know, can we as African people live in these liminal spaces, these in-between spaces, these spaces between? We're not on the continent of Africa, those of us in the United States and the diaspora, but in the places we are, it's not the Caribbean, it's not Latin America with its own distinct set of challenges. It's the United States of America where so many of us are so clouded in our thinking that we don't really know what we are except responding to racism. And so trying to fashion a place to live in that space, the African Center Education Movement in some ways trying to respond to what Du Bois lines out. Once these laws change, what you gonna do? Part of it, you gotta answer questions of race and culture. The African Center Education Movement was attempting to answer questions of race and culture. How are we gonna be in a world we don't live separately from anybody else in the United States of America. We don't live separately from anybody else in the world. But in living together, we should not disappear with our special cultural truths. We should not disappear with our own community formations. We should not disappear with our governance formation because our ways of knowing have something to say to the world. Our continuing contribution to science and technology has something to teach the world. Our cultural meaning making literally shapes the entire world. Our music, our dance, our, the way that we create art shapes the world and our movement and memory is lacking because we do not do what Jacob Carruthers, again, another Chicagoan would say, which is break the chain that links African ideas to European ideas and speak to your ancestors without interpreters. It's a threat to the funky settler colony that has invested its entire force behind convincing you somehow that George Washington was something other than a criminal that Tom Jefferson and James Madison were something other than criminals. You wouldn't have to be convinced that there's something other than criminals if they were alive today operating a human trafficking ring in Virginia. But you have to be convinced that somehow they're not criminals because somehow the idea that they enslaved people is overlooked when you see them writing with a quill pen, all men are created equal. It's absurd on its face. So the movement and memory piece, we have to remember that if we had been doing a lot during those times, it would not only have been proper, it would have been celebrated to cut their heads off because they were literally not only oppressing, they were enslaving your ancestors in death camps. And somehow we now aspire to be uh, associated with them, but can we live then in these liminal, in these between spaces? The African Center Movement was attempt to answer that question because Du Bois says, if once you cut yourself off from the African world and see your primary identity as being grounded in the death camp you were, your ancestors were captured and brought into, you have cut yourself off from the possibility of a true full contribution to humanity. And in so doing, you have created a liminal space. I'm using my language to kind of describe what Du Bois is talking about. And once you've done that, well, now you have, you can see why he floats this concept of double consciousness. I'm aware of myself, kind of, and I'm aware of how these other people look at me. I've commingled with social structure and governance structure. And now I'm pretty much like a 
clean glass of water that you poured into. You can't drink it and you can't use it to write. You're in a liminal space now. You're in a useless space in a way. So, you know, can we make these liminal spaces home? Should we try? Um, the question isn't, as Ron Walters often raises, when did we become Americans? When did we become people from the US? When did we become Haitians or Jamaicans? The question is, when did we stop being Africans? One of the things we talked about last night is we never did. You can see it. And, and, and one of the reasons Kim wanted to have this program is to talk about what black studies is. And that's all we do in this space is, is think about these conceptual categories, these framing questions and how we can think differently by changing how we approach the study of Africana. And so it isn't just about subject matter, black people popping up in history. No, it's about how we think about ourselves and the world and reality. And black studies helps us do two things. The first thing it does is help us render the invisible visible. We talked about that a lot last night. In other words, it begins to allow us to see the world as it is. Here is whiteness. The power of whiteness is in its invisibility. So when you say, when you have to add black to something, you're revealing the fact that the invisible assumption is white. Historically, black colleges and universities, why? Because colleges and universities are white. So you talk about, anytime you put black, black excellence, why? Because excellence is white. What you're really doing is reinforcing your miserable oppression by having to put black, putting the adjective in front of it. Now I know people, there's an argument to be made and, and I don't think that it's completely out of place to make the argument that you could say that um, by putting black in front of it, you're elevating it. And I'm not closed off to that possibility. But my thing is, why do we have to use the racial language in the first place? So black studies helps render the invisible visible. And then having done that, having used that to create a social structure category, who are we to other people that needs to be studied but shouldn't be the center of our identity, we can get to the governance question. And that is to begin to explore who we are to each other and to debate, plan, life, and decide what to do with that awareness. And that's the work now of coming together. So, so that was in a, in a nutshell Chicago. But I wanna spend just a minute or two before we wind up because this is a two-part conversation we're having here in Chicago at the DuSable Museum. And, and, and I wish I could take you all out into the foyer so you could see the beautifully curated uh, murals in stone, mosaics of the founders, Margaret Burroughs, Charlie Burgess, the, Burroughs, the great Hanya Robbie Robb, the great uh, autodidact and teacher here in Chicago for many years. Um, there's so many in, 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 the, in, the, in the foyer. And, and some of the exhibits, there's a beautiful exhibit on Equiano that we worked on, Kim and I, with a kind of international team uh, that made a kind of series of Insta, Insta stories on Equiano to link with the book. Um, there's a beautiful permanent display on Harold Washington. So, so, so many other things here in, in the DuSable Museum. But to, yes, last night was part one of the conversation on jailbreaking the Black University. Today, uh, beginning at, I think, nine central which would be 10 eastern um, and, and you know when i finish i'll go join them uh educators and really the public has been invited and a lot of people who were here last night are coming back today for uh, a teach-in a cultural teach-in around the conceptual categories and around um ebonics kim is, is leading a conversation around black speech about black culture and i'm going to lead a conversation around how to apply the Africana Studies conceptual categories. A lot of educators were here last night, principals, teachers, uh, some comrades who I'd never met in person, got to embrace a lot of people who we see here and in class and in office hours and throughout the week in Nubia who came. Many of them are teachers, so I get the chance to see them. Saw some people we went to Kemet with, saw the fam. I was very happy to see them. A similar experience took place on Tuesday night in Columbia. South Carolina. I went down there at the behest of the Catalyst in Bangi and the Comedic Institute for Human Development. Uh, Dr. Burnett Gallman, Bernie Gallman, um, Jerome Boykin, uh, James Robinson, so many others, Baba Derek Jackson, our sister Catherine Adams, Cat Adams, and the crew there, and also hosted at uh, oh, Dr. Bill Gunn. William Gunn, retired professor from Benedict College. I was so happy to be back on the campus of Benedict. Been there many times. Across the street from Allen University, of course, when we talked about Dave Chappelle at the time, deep in the heart, you know, that's where his, his folk kind of have, have a deep vested interest there. 
But I was able to, you know, be there. And I got a chance to see someone who I hadn't seen since uh, she left the Washington area, Dr. Verna Orr. Verna Orr was the chief of staff. Uh, she's the chief of staff at Benedict College. Dr. Rosalind Artis is the president, sister is president of Benedict. And uh, before that, Verna was at Howard University with my dear friend and brother, Sidney Rabot, the 16th president of Howard. She uh, was his executive assistant. And then she went on to, to, to come to Benedict. So she was there Thursday night. Uh, Mignon Clyburn, James Clyburn's daughter, was there. It's good to see her. Um, it was very interesting to be in Columbia, South Carolina, the capital of South Carolina, talking about this question of Africana studies and talking about it in South Carolina, another incredibly black space. I'm, I'm just, you know, I count myself to be very fortunate over the last few days to have been in black as hell, South Carolina. Black as hell in Chicago and black as hell in Atlanta in a couple of days, thinking with and among our people, holding up mirrors to each other and saying, look at yourself. And then putting those mirrors down and saying, let's look at each other and let's be who we are to each other and let's get these institutions straight. In South Carolina Tuesday, um, Kathy picked me up at the airport and we went immediately. She took me to a place that I think everyone should visit. And you can visit virtually until you can come physically in Orangeburg, South Carolina, not far from where she teaches at Claflin University and of course across the, across the fence, where well, there's a hole in the fence, right next to <laughs> Claflin, of course, is, is South Carolina State University. Shout out to the Bulldogs. The, she took me directly to the Cecil Williams, South Carolina Civil Rights Museum. There was no museum devoted to black people in the state of South Carolina prior to the Cecil Williams South Carolina Civil Rights Museum and he's very close with Jim Clyburn they've been able to get some funding to expand the museum because now of course we know the museum that, that the Nubians went to that y'all went to um, during Healthy Wealthy and Wise which is of course the International Museum in Charleston and but the Cecil Williams Museum oh my god Cecil Williams is a photographer he's 86 years old uh, here I am in Chicago thinking about John H. Johnson and Johnson Publications. Cecil Williams was the Johnson Company's man in Orangeburg and by extension in South Carolina. Cecil Williams is one of the great cultural meaning makers of our time. He is one of those photographers you have to put on the short list with people like Roy Lewis, with people like Jim Alexander in Atlanta. Cecil Williams has the museum that he funded himself. He doesn't charge it missing. He is an architect who designs and builds houses. It, it's like a futuristic, you talk about Afrofuturism, I know people talk about this is a guy who literally, it's got this futuristic kind of model, this big, huge white building. He lives in the, 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 the second building he ever designed, his house, which is on the corner in this black as hell neighborhood. He designed it and then had people contribute to building it from the neighborhood stonemasons, people who do drywall, people, and it is a beautiful building. In fact, I was like, Bob and Cecil, I know y'all gonna get a new building, it's gonna be beautiful, it's gonna be across the street from Claflin in South Carolina State, but my God, this building here has a specialty to it. And 80% of the photographs in there, he took himself. Uh, before leaving, I was able to get several of his books. If you go to the website of the Cecil Williams uh, South Carolina Civil Rights Museum, you can see the books. Um, he uses the funding from the books, which he publishes himself. He's a publisher. So prop the two of y'all got to be in conversation. Cecil Williams, my God, he has a book called Out of the Box in Dixie, where he traces the resistance of African people in South Carolina from the late 19th century forward. And the photographs in them are his photographs. He's got a, a, a book I was able to get my hands on called Orangeburg 1968, which traces the Orangeburg massacre. In his museum, he's got five shotgun shells, empty shotgun shells that the police used to shoot at and kill black people at the Orangeburg massacre because he was there. I mean, that's just the, just the beginning of it. He's very close to the Briggs family. That's Briggs versus Elliott. That is the case that precedes Brown versus Board of Education. It becomes one of the five cases that is consolidated under the title Brown versus Board of Education. And he has many of their personal items and artifacts. Uh, he has photographs of everybody from John Kennedy. This man known John Kennedy since he was a senator from Massachusetts and he flew on Kennedy's plane 
camp, during the campaign. And when he would go at the White House or other places, and they'd be like, "Oh, Negro, do you have credentials?" And he, if he saw the Kennedys, Jack or, or Jack and Kennedy, they'd be like, "Oh, Cecil," and they would wave him past so Secret Service and all that. And all that. Cecil gets to come with us. I mean, it's a fascinating story, but. He, Thurgood Marshall, he is one of the famous photographs of Thurgood Marshall that's used in many of the books. And Cecil Williams took that picture because Marshall was coming here, this, uh, here, I'm like, I'm still in South Carolina, coming to South Carolina to help cultivate the cases that eventually ended up consolidated with the Brown cases. Um, Septa McClark, uh, I mean, just so many different people that he's known just about everybody. He's captured most of them in film. But I'm bringing that up because for two reasons. One, it is Cecil Williams' contention. And I don't think he's wrong about this that much of what we call the so-called civil rights movement in the United States of America in the 1950s and 60s had its origins in South Carolina, out of black institutions, out of the churches, out of the professional associations, out of the HBCUs. And it was that organized effort that contributed to, that was a major tributary to, in terms of the fight for education, the foundation for the assault on apartheid in this country. And, and he makes a compelling case. If you get any of those books, in fact, there's a brand new book that was just published called Injustice in Focus, Injustice in Focus, the Civil Rights Photography of Cecil Williams. And you can see how he, he it tells his life story, but it also tells his life story in the context of the photographs he took. And the only thing that, that it makes me um, determine that Karen Hunnam Publishing, the Third World Press here in Chicago, by Haki Mahabudi, that uh, the great Paul, William Paul Coates and Black Classic Press that my friend Casahoon Ch Chico and, and After World Press, that they must occupy the center of our publishing. Y'all must occupy the center of our publishing efforts, including Cecil Williams Publishing, because that's who publishes the photography books, must now be the center, Must should have always been, but must now be the center because the last book, which just came out a couple of months ago, which I was able to get my hands on because I wanted him to autograph all the books, and he did for me and Kathy as well. Uh, she got a copy, Injustice and Focus, published by the University of South Carolina Press. I don't like that. I never will like it, and I'll never make peace with that. I would rather it be published than not published, so that you know two things can be true at once. But just like I would love for Don Staley to raise, cut down the nets at the NC 2A Women Basketball Championship as the head coach of South Carolina, State University instead of University of South Carolina. No, that's not going to happen. I would like for us to have our black self-determination literature published by us in an act of self-determination. Otherwise, it just becomes fodder for the vultures who didn't stand when they should have to now come back around and say, we'll be the ones who help you tell your story. Go to hell. So in, at Benedict College, after we went out there, we came over to Benedict and, and uh, we got underway. We talked about South Carolina in many ways being the heart of Africana cultural meaning making and movement and memory and resistance to oppressive social structures. Everything from Briggs versus Elliott to the work of Septa McClark and other citizenship education program, um, uh, the Orangeburg massacre, Esau Jenkins with, uh, with uh, Septa McClark, I should mention, in terms of the Sea Islands, where y'all were there at Kiowa, all that South Carolina. And, you know, one of the things that was raised Thursday night when we were in conversation at the Listerbelt Middleton lecture. This was the 29th, I think, Listerbelt Middleton lecture. I, I actually gave that talk, the Listerbelt Middleton lecture, I think it was the 11th lecture. Um, we were actually in the chapel um, on campus. And that was very important to me because, as I mentioned last week, that's where Dr. Du Bois gave the famous 1946 speech, Behold the Land. This time we were in the student center which was just, you know, a beautiful moment to be there as well, because uh, I remember being there several times for ASCAC international conferences. Um, and I mean, there's a whole backstory there, but I won't go into it right now. But South Carolina, in many ways, is the anchor of that. So just like Chicago is a place where our people came and built black institutions, which still echo through to this day. Some of them continue to exist. South Carolina is a place where black folk used our cultural meaning making to fortify our governance formations and assaulted the oppressive social structures and forced our way in. That's what makes what's happening now in South Carolina, like around the country, so pregnant with possibility at the same time, unrealized possibility. Without the momentum of memory, the question can be raised, how come the entire South is not different politically? How come Georgia, Mississippi, and Louisiana, how comes North and South Carolina, how come Florida, how come you know these states are not 
places where African people have more political power in the formal structures. So South Carolina should not be a place that is represented by white nationalists and uh, and blackface white nationalists like Tim Scott. You shouldn't have Little Lynn Scott and Tim, uh, Little Lynn Graham and Tim Scott in the federal legislature in the, in the Senate. You know, you can't have uh, Nimrata Haley, uh, you know, engaged in cosplay. As I told him on, on, on Tuesday night, I said, I stayed up all night watching the C-SPAN debates over taking that flag down. And of course, Karen mentioning, you know, the work that you lent your shoulder to the wheel in and getting that flag down. There were people, I have no doubt, in that uh, convening on Tuesday night who signed the petition that you launched, who were among the many thousands who signed that petition. These are South Carolinians. Y'all know how to fight. We down the street from the place where the flag was. And God bless Bree Newsom, our sister Bree Newsom. I said, but there are people in this audience who remember Reverend E.X. Slave, who tried to set fire that flag so much that that's where the fence around the flag came from in the police cruiser, because he stood across the street with a, in a Santa Claus suit in rain, snow, rain, sleet, snow, hail, blazing 100 degree weather. And the minute they looked the other way, he's across the damn street with a step ladder and then a longer ladder trying to burn that damn flag. I mean, there's resistance here, and it's not launched in being a figment of the white imagination. It's launched from the African cultural meaning making. When I think of Nubia, when I think of narrative, when I think of in class, when I think of what's going on with everybody from Sam Reynolds to Senyata Ahmed, when I think about Mario Beatty, when I think about the classes on yoga and the classes on meditation and wellness, when I think about the ones to come, when I think about a platform that began with Can I Press Record and now is at the point where thousands of people convene regularly, I'm thinking about an extension of that form of being. Whither now and why? What are we going to do now and why are we going to do it? The question you were open today with, what is the purpose? What's the objective? What is the reason? We can answer that question by looking into our memory and regaining the momentum. We have answered that question. So finally, from South Carolina, the lesson that we never stop being African. These are Africans. The lesson that the loss of that galvanizing cultural glue has impacted us negatively, but can be recovered, is the lesson that I took from being in that sacred space of South Carolina with these unreconstructed Africans who are children of the soil of South Carolina and also Africans, foundationally Africans, not foundationally Black Americans, because our foundation didn't start on the land of the indigenous people that was invaded by Europeans and you drug us into the criminal enterprise. What kind of warped concept of self does that invite into our spirits? And so, you know, like I said, come from South Carolina into Chicago here in Illinois and then going um, over this weekend to Atlanta for a meeting of the Higher Education Advisory Council for the History Makers, our great oral history database with over 150,000 interviews uh, stockpiled on the database and more coming, not the database, the archive and coming. Larry Crow, having done so many of those, our master historian in many ways, our master listener, the worthy uh, the worthy protege of many people we talked about last night who were here in Chicago, Bobby Wright, Jim Carruthers, Harold Pates, you know, Francis Chris Wilson, so many people coming through these spaces. You know, we're going to talk about this question of intergenerational work and community. We're going to talk about what it means to listen. As we were saying last night, we we're in conversation. The idea is that we have to listen to each other. If we truly believe that we have worth in the world as human beings, then we know that our experiences must be shared with each other because they are worthy to be shared and they bring our common humanity together. And so common themes from earlier in the week in South Carolina to here today and tomorrow, uh, yesterday and today in Chicago, and then over the weekend going to the first part of the week in Atlanta. The struggle for Africans and the struggle for Africana is a struggle for self-determination and independent spaces. This is what the framework is about. The conceptual categories are about. This is what Du Bois is evoking in Whither Now and Why. What will our education be and who will it be for? In an age of white theocracy in the United States, when the district attorney of Maricopa County, Arizona says, I don't care. I don't trust the district attorney of Manhattan, an, an American Negro who has worked hard to prove himself worthy of white approval. 
You know, I can put Jonathan Majors in jail. I can police it. And the white nationalist district attorney of Maricopa County, Arizona said, I don't care. I don't care. So someone who was murdered in New York, the killer flees, flees to Arizona and the white nationalist clan adjacent white nationalist, proud MAGA white nationalist, district attorney of Maricopa County, Florida says, I'm not extraditing this alleged killer for prosecution in New York state. That's pro forma. That's just what you do, extradition, but not in a country where that was never a nation. It was never a nation. Let me repeat, it was never a nation. Never one concept of who the people were that is so emboldened now that these white nationalists who are so close to regaining federal power, they can smell it, are now operating in brazen fashion. I'm not extraditing a, 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 a potential killer for trial in New York because I don't trust the N-word who runs the district attorney office in. You can't, that's against the law. I am the law. Whiteness is the law in the state of Alabama. Why does Alabama look like it does? We've got enough black people there to do work. You know, um, like you said, we, we've done in class. I was in Montgomery and Tuskegee going back this summer. We're going to do more work down there. We're going to be connected with even more people. I'm looking forward to tracking down my brother, uh, Camille, Camille Hayes, talk more about this book he wrote. But you know, we saw what the Supreme Court of Alabama did. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is a stone cold clan of Jason White nationalists. And he writes a concurring opinion to an absurd ruling that embryos are children. And he quotes God, which means he's quoting his own deluded self. Multiple, so many times that you would think that he didn't know that there's separation of church and state. Well, let's just say that what he does know that there is no separation of church and state in a theocracy. This white boy done gone so far off the reservation that the other white nationalists are trying to back up off him. Why? Because the clinics that offer in vitro fertilization in the state of Alabama have paused doing it until they can figure out what the hell's going on. And even the white nationalists in the Alabama state legislature are saying we need to pass some legislation to protect that. Why? Because this these people are going off the rail. But it was an eight to one decision, Alabama Supreme Court and all nine, the judges on the Alabama Supreme Court are in the white nationalist party, the Republicans. That is not only unacceptable, it's inexplicable, except we've forgotten the battles we fought in Alabama. We're going to revisit them and regain some momentum of memory. Black folks should have something to say politically. It's very different than what's being said right now in these states behind the cotton curtain. But the main reason that we don't get involved more is because we've lost the momentum of memory, which we talked about a little bit last night as well. So, you know, whether now and why? is the question that we need to be asking ourselves today. Whether, um, is that where we are now and why? Mm -hmm. whether, whether such a, you know. A, a where, 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 where do we go? Where do we go from now? Right. So it's sort of like the question that um, Dr. Martin Luther King asked posthumously. Yes. Wow. Uh, and if you take that second H out, it's wider now and why. <laughs> you know, yes. You know, I was thinking about, um, yes. the the evolution of a W.E.B. Du Bois and how we flatten him so often when we talk about him. And I just want to say how grateful I am for the deep study. You know, we're not just spending one week or two weeks or no. three weeks. You you have immersed us in, in the mind of W.E.B. Du Bois. And we did a little bit of it last year when we broke down Souls of Black Folk, um, which is available in narrative in our yes. resources uh, on our bookshelf because we have books there and we've done several uh, kind of in class with cars or inserted into the books, um, yes. which is something uh, very unique. But I was just thinking like his evolution, we are constantly hopefully evolving. What was the difference between the 1890 W.B. Du Bois writings and this 1940 piece. And then when he gave the deuces. <laughs> and <left. laughs> oh, wow. That's let, let me say, I think it's interesting that you raised that. Prof. Of course, in the 1890s, remember Du Bois is born in 1868. So three years after the end of the Civil War, he's born during Reconstruction, but he's born in Massachusetts. He's raised in a household, as we know, and we won't go into what's out of biography because we've talked about that many times, but very humble household, becoming the Black Burkharts, his mother's people. His mother passes when he's in high school, just at graduation. 
and he is sent to the South for the first time because the white boys in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, when he was raised, the so-called town fathers, not going to let him go to Harvard because he assumed he's going to Harvard. He's top of his class. That's what the white boys do in his town. No, but we will send you to the best Negro school. And Du Bois for the rest of his life said, that rescued me. When I went to Fisk and I saw those black students and I got the spirit of, of learning, even though I was behind that cotton curtain. In fact, the joke, I think it's in the autobiography when he says, you know, I got on campus and I looked into the face of the most beautiful creature God ever made. It was them black women. Du Bois said, shit, I'm, I'm going to be the leader of this race right here. I don't know what y'all talking about. And I think he spent his life in many ways. I think about Allison Davis, of course, the great Dunbar High School graduate, social scientist who wrote a book called Leadership, Love and Aggression. And in some ways, maybe Du Bois spent his whole life trying to find his mother again in the faces of these black women he was in love with because Du Bois loved black women. But that Du Bois grows to a maturity from Fisk, then to Harvard, then to Wilberforce to teach, Atlanta University, uh, then comes to the NAACP. Well, when he gives the conservation of racist speech, he, is, he has spent time overseas, earns everything except writing up the final product for the second PhD at the University of Berlin. Du Bois has become exposed to this concept of race and culture. And he phrases it in the conservation of races along the lines of uh, almost bloodline. But he's talking about culture. He has a theory of culture that remains remarkably consistent through his life, even as he adds other pieces to it. So for that first iteration, as he is doing the Atlanta University studies, as he is moving through thinking about black contributions to the world, he's grounding it in the idea of black possibility. But in the late 19th century, this is how our Africa is under invasion and assault. This is where Jim and Jane Crow are riding high after the, after the end of Reconstruction imposed by these white masters in collusion North and South. The, 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 the continuing expansion of the settler project called the United States of America, it isn't even finished make, cutting up the, the, the land in the states. And Du Bois is fighting with this idea that we've got to push back against whiteness as it is forming into this not only formidable enemy of our common humanity, but one that is yet unfinished. But by the time you get to 1940, this man has lived through one world war, is on the verge of another world war, has seen the expansion of US, uh, of US imperialism into the, West, the rest of the, uh, the, the world at the end of World War I, as the United States becomes now a global force, this child of European imperialism as it expanded, an empire that now becomes the adult. In fact, I, you know, I had to go by Powell's bookstore over uh, on 57th near the University of Chicago campus yesterday for a few minutes to get a few books. And one of them was on this question of Africa at the League of Nations. When we talked about that, we talked about Ralph Bunch. And I'd never seen this book before, Negro University Press reprint. So I was able to pick that up. And, you know, and flipping through it, you get this sense that they've always been plotting on taking our stuff. Well, Du Bois lived through that. By the time in 19, 1940 comes along, he's now... In his 70s, remember, by 1940, he's given those speeches at Fisk, the revelation of St. Organ of the Dam, the field and function of the Negro College. He's given those speeches. And by the time he gets to the revelation of St. Organ the Damned, he is writing about having lived seven decades. So when he writes Dusk of Dawn, which he calls an autobiography of a race concept, he has a concept of race that has now been uh filled out with a materialist argument, the notion of not just the spirit of a people, which he kind of borrows in some ways from the Germans, but more importantly, borrows from African people, as we see in Souls of Black Folk. We got a soul. We got a spirit that has something special to speak to the world. You see it in Conservation of Races, 1897. By 1940, he has now lived through the world, world wars. He's seen the death of human possibility in terms of what Nicholas Baker calls human smoke with World War I, the, the capacity of humanity to destroy itself from the air with mustard gas and bombs and planes and shit. Du Bois is seeing that, and what's bubbling up in him is a sense that this, this, this type of capacity for destruction must be stopped and it can't be stopped just politically and economically. That's important. But the, but the center of that is culture. He's not wrong about that in the 19th century. But by 1940, he's saying, you know, we've got to step up and speak to the world and stop this. And not just as black Americans, but as black people who are part of a human family. And there are a lot of people in the world who feel the same way we do, including the people from the place we came from who are trying to fight their way out of colonialism. So dusk of dawn you know it's darkest before the dawn but the dawn is coming but what happens between 1940 when he writes dusk of dawn 
which is considered one of his autobiographies, but is a brilliant exposition of his thinking to that point. He's written Black Reconstruction in America five years before. He's got this materialist concept, but he's also walking through his life between 1940 and 1960. Du Bois now lives through the Great War, World War II, and the and the 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 creation of nuclear weapons and the possibility of nuclear holocaust. He stands alongside his wife. He stands alongside his friends, Shirley and uh, I mean, uh, Essie and Paul Robeson and, and, and uh, Louise Thompson Patterson and, and her husband, uh, William Patterson. He stands alongside uh, Esther Cooper Jackson and James Jackson. Esther Cooper Jackson was a student who introduced Du Bois in 1946 at Columbia, in Columbia, at Benedict College, in that chapel when he gives the Behold the Land speech as a member, Esther Cooper was, of the Southern Negro Youth Conference, the, this Congress, the first SNCC. You know, so, but now she's an adult. She and her husband standing against this, and they are punished by the state, by the United States, the same United States that had uh, Martin Luther King under surveillance, the same United States that colluded with the Chicago police to kill Mark Clark and Fred Hampton, the same that they looked at these people as enemies of the state because they are pushing for peace. Dorothy and Alphaeus Hutton and so many, they're pushing for peace. And when the United Nations is formed in 1945, they go to the United Nations and the United Nations six years later and say in 1955, 51, we charge genocide. So all the signatories of the We Charge Genocide petition, if they were alive on top of the earth today, instead of being in the ancestral realm, they would be, I have no doubt, on the side of the Palestinians in the United Nations saying, we charge genocide. Du Bois has lived through all that. He's seen his passport taken in 1950. And from 1950 to 1958, he and Shirley can't travel anywhere. The Robesons can't travel anywhere. And so by the time he gets to 1960, he's lived through all that. And when he says whether now and why, what he is saying is, we are living in a radically transformed world than the one I grew up in. It's even radically transformed from the one that I came through in the 1940s. In 1940, I said it might take 50 years. I was wrong about that. It's about to happen. He makes transition in August 1963 in Ghana, literally, literally the night before the March on Washington. So he, he's right there on the cusp, and he's born in 1868. The only person whose lifespan is longer, born a little earlier, passed away a little bit later, is Anna Julia Cooper, who is another figure that we, maybe we should read her a voice from the yeah. South. You know, so we could, we could think about her, because Cooper is there for the whole thing too. Mary Church Terrell is there. We, of course, we talked about Terrell early on with Robert Terrell and her family, but maybe we look and read her work, A Colored Woman in a White World. And we think about the international vision of these people. Again, this question of the being descended from enslaved, we're all descended from enslaved in one way or another if we're in the United States, but at the same, well, at least not all of us, but most of us, but that should not diminish our capacity to see the connections between ourselves globally. So finally, Du Bois, by 1960, looking back over his long life, and as you remember when we read the revelation of St. Organ the Dam, Du Bois is like, yo man, I've been here at this point 70 some years. I don't know. I could die today. I could die tomorrow. He didn't know in 1936 that he was going to have another almost 30 years of life. So by 1960, he's seen just about everything a human being can see of African descent. And he says, when I traveled to China and the Soviet Union, he's 91 years old. He says, my whole, in fact, well, if I could find it quickly, but again, we're going to talk about this Monday night. So if you've got a subscription and you're in Nubia, y'all should, if you haven't been coming, you should absolutely come Monday night because from Atlanta, we are going to grapple with this question of what Du Bois is saying. He said, watch this. He said, on page 200, he said, Paul Robeson, who for 10 years had been deprived of a livelihood for equally baseless reasons, myself and others were given passports. It's 1958. He says, I and my wife went abroad to Great Britain and Holland, to France and Czechoslovakia, to Sweden and Germany, to the Soviet Union and to the Chinese Republic. This man, 90 years old. Next line, he says, it was the most astonishing trip I have ever had. Now, mind you, he's been around the whole world many times. The man, 90 years old. Professor, he says, it radically changed my whole point of view. Du Bois was never afraid of changing. But what was consistent from 1897 to 1960 was his theory that black people got something special to say to the world. He says, I saw first that America and its actions since the First World War was thoroughly condemned by 
Oh, come on. I'm sitting here. Ah. Okay, we're going to wait for Dr. Carr to come back. And, you know, I asked that question because so many of us um, or live a little bit. I'm sorry, Dr. Carr, you popped out. But um, you know, I asked you this question about the evolution of W.B. Du Bois because he had lived almost 100 years intentionally, you know, mm -hmm. being denied. Every, ever since he was denied entrance into Harvard the first time, it seems like his whole life was to make white folk pay for, for that, <laughs> that egregious act through inspiring the rest of us to step into our purpose. And I just think about living a hundred years and I'm excited about uh, reading and spending time with Anna Julia Cooper because she's not uh, a household name, but to live a, a century with intention makes you almost like a vampire. You know, you have vampires. Oh, oh, oh no question, no they question. Live forever and they get to see things. But for that last passage brought me so much joy because we should always be, you know, interested to to have our ideals and ideas challenged that will force us into a different way of seeing the world so finish please finish reading from that because that no 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 no, no. I, I'll, I'll stop there you know why i'll stop because what what you're responding to is the heart of what we're talking about right now people can come back monday and we can get more into it but you just said it i mean can you imagine that here yes. you are you yes. thought you <laughs> yeah you can can't yeah. you because you know it <laughs> right i mean I, you know it's so funny being in South Carolina Tuesday, being here in Chicago last night and today, being going to go, go anticipating going to Atlanta, but being in these first two places just this week, seeing so many old friends, so many Jagnas, so many of people who have really trained me, and then meeting all these other people, many of whom are here in community with us right now, who are part of this community. And again, all of that energy of gratitude, that energy, I'm talking about young people who came to me and said, y'all changed my whole life. I said, what do you mean? What do you mean? I mean, because now I'm reading, I'm thinking. Um, our brother came from Texas and flew up. He said, I got a cheap flight. I said, I knew y'all was going to be here, so I came. I mean, people in South Carolina, here I, and we're sitting here in Columbia. Here comes this crew from Atlanta. Here comes this crew from Charlotte. What, Nubians, I'm talking about who said, well, he's going to be in Columbia. So the Nubians come from other states, you understand? And, and they're saying, you know, part this work here is the foundation. So you, you, you know, having this vision and all of us not only buying into it, but supporting it wholeheartedly to create this narrative space, and then Nubia emerging in that narrative space. Now, the physical connections, it's just like, as, as you've been very, and talk about intent, Du Bois is also very intentional, as you said, planning his life. He was an inveterate planner like you are. You know, that plan to see it in real time, you realize ain't none of this unintentional. Yes. It's very intentional. So, yeah, I want to, uh, in fact, I know Cam, I probably, Cam is probably somewhere here in the building. She probably manages something because I'm teaching and I'm starting a few. But if, you, if you're watching, I just she's probably watching in class. You should come to the auditorium and say hello to these people while you're in. But go ahead, Brock, because I, I don't no, know if no, she, she might be watching. I was going to say a couple of things. First of all, we are in Black History Month because the boys live, right? There's no Black History Month because Carter G. Woodson is, is following in those footsteps, right? Yes. How yes. Many yes. <laughs> He's inspired. And and again, you know, when you talk about Nubians coming from all over, it's to be in community, but there's also a safety factor. Folk, I feel like folk show up to make sure everybody's good. No I question. Like they show up to make sure. Oh, yeah. Everybody's good. And I feel yes. that with every fiber of my being. And I know that, you know, so many folk come with intention to make sure that you're going to be good wherever you are. And then finally, I, I wrote down Cecil Williams because... It, yes, it, you know it connected today. Is it possible, Doctor Carr? Because y'all y'all don't know, but we've been planning, um, you know, to to get those books that you see piled up in, yes. in the space that now sitting now in warehouses, um, into a space very Absolutely. similar to what Cecil Williams did. Is it Absolutely. is it possible? Can can we can we have a conversation about that broadening yes. that yes. book right there? Uh -huh. That's all, listen, all I've been taught. Listen, I wish when you go, because we're claiming you're going, when you go oh. to the Cecil Williams Museum, it is going to blow your mind. This well, black man designed it, bro, and then got people from the neighborhood to build it, and it looks better than anything you. I'm like, this dude is a genius. Well, you look, know, look, I, why, 
<laughs> we'll have to do Healthy Wealthy Wise twice, two more times this year, just because of the, the waiting list is ridiculous. So we're coming back to South Carolina. <laughs> no, and I'm driving down next time. I'm not flying in. Good. But so oh, that allows me to have more flexibility. I definitely want to do that. And I want to sit uh, with You got to sit with him. You got to yeah, sit with and him. And I got to sit with him. Yeah, no, this is everything. Is I think Kim is behind. Is Kim behind you? Is yes. Kim Come on, Dr. Delaney. This is Dr. Yeah. Kim Delaney. Now, she's not going to be able to hear. I'm going to take oh, this off so we can do. I'm going to put this here. Hold on. Let me uh, put these up. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Now, Kim can see. No, she, look, she, look, she, look, come on, say hello. She, look, she, I she, got she it. got it. She, she can't look, sit, sit in this chair and say hello to the uh, professor. Sit in that chair. That is nothing there. You said somebody got to sit down. Come on now. Live show. Dr. Kim Delaney. Hello, everybody. Hi, Hi, Dr. Delaney. Hey, Karen. How are you? I am good. Thank you for, uh, you know, uh, everybody that invite, invites Dr. Carr somewhere gives us so much more than we could even expect because, you know, he's going to come <laughs> to a place and then extract all of the goodness and then pour it into us. So Absolutely. Thank, you, thank you for this. Um, tell us a little bit about what, what people will be expecting today. Yes. Well, today we're going to do, it's, it's about to start now, right now. They're having a breakfast up there. But we're going to be doing a conversation about uh, English, Ebonics, and ESL, navigating the politics of language in the classroom. That's the first session. And I'm going to do this uh teach this writing technique that I created called Pack in the Kitchen after we watched this film about, uh, what's the guy's name who created the a documentary out of Georgia State about Ebonics? Oh, I can't tell you. What it is. No, anyway, yeah. but we're going to watch this documentary about Ebonics and how you'll see, they'll see the elements of how it is actually a language. We're going to talk about the purpose of language is communication and how different languages are structured. Then we're going to talk about how uh, teachers can teach uh, students to translate and be successful with writing these essays and things like that. And then the second half, then we'll have lunch, a working lunch. The second half, we're going to be talking about uh, Africana Studies framework and going through that. Well, this so is that's what we're doing today. But what was, was really important is we're trying to get you booked live right here on this show. What? Uh, what? What, what happened? What? It was really important. We're trying to get you booked live, live and in person, live and in color, right here on this show. We're trying to get a commitment for Karen Hunt. When is she coming to Chicago? To be I told in you, I tried to tell them you not. Okay. You're not so I was in Chicago last year. We did a Food Says Friday live at at the City Winery. Yeah, so I know. Shout out to everybody that was there. And you know, Chicago is always, you know, it's kind of like gotta be there. Chicago yeah. is an epicenter as Dr. Carr said, South Carolina. So my next couple of trips are going to be in South Carolina, but Chicago's on the list. Dr. Dublin, <laughs> let us know. Sense. You got to come through and then we'll arrange something special here at Tusabo. Well, that, you, you know what? Back. You know why it's so easy? Because I just want to get a hug uh, from, from oh my God, Dr. Jeremiah Wright. And, yeah. you know, I just I just want to just want to wrap my I just want to. Girl, ooh. he ended the show last night. I said, well, I'm sitting up there trying not to cry. No, Greg trying not to cry. I'm no looking way. at glossy eyes all in the audience. I'm like, this thing is over because everybody wants to get to him now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that, so he ended it uh, quite well. We were very happy to see. What a pleasant surprise. He was smiling and happy. We had food here afterwards. So it was a good time. Well, that that say less, you know, I'll be there. I'll be there. And thank you for for all that you do. Dr. Dulaney is D.U. Dulaney. Dulaney. Yeah. 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 Now, now, this time, Karen, I don't have the uh, iPad. OK, no problem. So, so no, when I say that is it won't be as shaky. But come on, Kim, show us the foyer. Look, okay, we, 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 we about to close off. But I want to come out into the light because there are a lot of people here yeah, there are people here. who Community well, there, groups for different things. No question. But people have not seen the DuSable Museum. So we won't see it today. Oh, their hair looks beautiful. All right, here we go. We, we in the light there. So this is just a little bit of the building. So you see, Chicago, look, here. This is the we're in the Harold Washington wing. You see Harold Washington there. Right. They're Harold Washington wing. So look, let's go to. I just want to go to the foyer. Oh, the elders. Yeah, the elders are here having a meeting. We're gonna go through them. Excuse us, y'all. Hi. How y'all doing? <laughs> All right. How you doing? Grant us permission to show you one. Doing? All right. Grant us permission. Grant us permission. 
<laughs> oh, right, right. Well, <laughs> actually, and, and for know. everyone saying, why does Dr. Carr have a film? Because he does these things, and I don't even know when he's gonna be where he's gonna be. <laughs> we could absolutely get a film through to the spaces. <laughs> That's right. I love it. Hey, wait a minute. I gotta show you this. One. I love, I love this it. is the this is the famous quote from the great founder Margaret Burroughs, who asked the question, "What shall I tell my children who are black?" That's the quote right there. Margaret Burroughs, the this is the great Richard Hunt who just passed away. That's one of his sculptures. It's an original Richard Hunt. Oh, tell him, tell him, Prof. Who was that? Harold Washington. This is a Harold Washington exhibit uh, in animatronics when that was. Oh, the animatronics thing. too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, that thing moves? Yeah, let me tell you. Oh, Lord. Look. See, that scared the hell out of me the first time I saw it. You got a Harold Washington. <laughs> Wait, that's not that's not a is that on okay he moves oh okay this is the Harold Washington wing so you there he is the 51st mayor of Chicago you see the pictures there of him the Washington campaign the great Conrad world of course um let's go to the right there's, quick. there's no Barack Obama without Harold Washington Just no question that. that's exactly right or Jeremiah Wright that's exactly Right. That it's on blacks in the military. Oh wow! Uh, there's a lot of different things in here. There's a many color of us exhibit, which is very powerful. Look at these black women in the military. What? Oh. Oh wow! Oh yeah. Look, this brother right here, John Tweedle, the fav regard the favorite photographer of Martin Luther King. Here are some of his photographs of Dr. Look at Andrew Young. Well, might see actually. They say he might be at the uh, piece. Here's Jesse Lewis Jackson, and of course, here's Jesse Jackson with Dr. King, Operation Breadbasket, coming forward here. Convention, All right? Dr. King. Look now. Here's a very famous photograph. John Tweedle took that photograph. Right. Seen Straight that it out. Straight it out. Tight. Yep. Okay. There we go. And we go now. We're gonna end in the foyer, right? Quick. We go through. Hey, Bob, how you doing? I'm oh, doing all right. Doing all right. Yeah, well, you know, they got they got signs posted here all over that says when you come in the building, just know that at any moment you might be recorded. So they, they already clear. Oh, okay, all right, all right, because I want no problems from the people. Won't be no problem. This is the great Margaret Burroughs. Let me see if I can get you there. The founder oh. in the mosaic. But I want to just say Oh, okay. oh, look, 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 look at right. these right. newbies. All right. You know All right. Class. All right, look. We're going in. All right. Here, look, look, say hello. These are Kenny people. We were with you when you Oh, oh, tell, tell them again, Bob. Hey, Karen, we was here when you was here at Windy City Live. Yeah. Oh, you saw us? Oh, we were there. <laughs> And she was the one that was dancing. Oh, no. oh, oh yes, y'all didn't show. Y'all did not show out. House music, Chicago. You, you know, you could have done yep. better. Y'all didn't. Karen, we went to high school yeah, together. We, we classmates. Wow. <laughs> hey, these Chicago people. I tell you, they don't play. No, I see y'all a minute. You coming down? Okay. You know what's so, so powerful right, about so we... this? How connected we all are. Like, oh, okay. it's about six degrees of separation. <laughs> There are no degrees of separation. All right. No. no. Is that, is that no okay. okay. You want okay. to? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna end with this corner right here. Okay. This brother here. This is one of Larry Crow. This is Hamia Rabbi Rob. You see, what I'm pointing to. This brother was known as one of the great historians of our people. Not lettered in degree, but the things he connected. We can go here. The, thank you, Bobby. The way he collected and curated us, he did calendars. The only one I've ever seen was in Dayton at Larry's house. He got one of them, the Rob calendars. Honey Robbie Rob traveled the world and then brought and took film and video. We're talking about the 1930s and 40s. Paul Rose and them, they would watch Hammy Robbie Rob's films of Africa, particularly classical Africa, Egypt, other places. And he, he had a house. He called it was the house of proper 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 knowledge, the house of knowledge, the house of proper propaganda was Mr. Misho in New York. Our people were not going to be divided, uh, denied. We in Kim's office now. 
So we're in there. You see Scott, he's African flags up here. Yes. Most experience. So I know I and I know you losing your mind over there. Ghana, Nigeria. She gives out flags to the children who come <laughs> because we are African people. Wait, where's the American flag? <laughs> oh, we don't have one. Well, what we got is Liberia, I guess. All right. Well, oh well. <laughs> oh well. Well, we're done. Actually, that was perfect to see them come in. They saw you when you were here. And then that's some of them Negroes that's harassing me about when you coming back. So now you know. <laughs> Love I'm you, under dude. the impression that nobody really cares. You know, they're there to see you. So that, look, that is the look, No, no. You saw that. I can't speak for that. They said that to you. See, that's what I'm saying. I came out that auditorium for that purpose right there. Okay. Now nobody can say I made that up. We did not okay. plan that. Do you understand? All right. Perfect. <laughs> Go serve the people. I am so grateful that you gave us that. And it, we got to do better with, with making sure that we can see all of this because th these things wouldn't have happened unless you did this today. So I, I got my notes from um, back course, to the lab to plan today to make sure that this this trip we're doing this summer to hit all of these spots. And Dr. Dr. Delaney, have an yeah. amazing event. And uh, thank you so much for all that you do for us as well. Thank you. Thank you for this and everything else that you do as everything. well. And we are so, and one hundred percent in support. Everywhere I go, people come up, give strangers come up, give me a hug, which is unusual. And then they, then they, say, and which is not even acceptable. But then they say, but then they smile and say, you know, I'm a newbie. And people always whisper. Then I'm like, oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Why do they always whisper? They always whisper. They always whisper. I'm, I'm a newbie. I'm a newbie. I'm a newbie. <laughs> And I saw in the chat, by the way, somebody said, I want to join Nubia, but I feel like that I have to catch up. You don't have to catch up. This no. is a river. Come on in. Come on in. Yeah. 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 And I expect a lot of people will be joining because a lot of people asked, what's this new last night? Yeah, what's last night there were people talking asking. about. Yeah. So we hope to have, you know, a lot of people join us. And uh, yeah, this is great work. Yeah. Great work. I appreciate you. We love you. Love you too. Always. All right. See y'all Monday night. Yes, sir. Yes, and ma'am. And everybody else. All have right. a beautiful, beautiful weekend. We will see you in office hours and some of you tomorrow. I think it's Maroon's Me Medicine Chest uh, and beyond. That's in Nubia. And those of you in YouTube, come on. Come on home. Come on home. Don't be scared. We're going to be here for the duration. We ain't going nowhere. I love you.